Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Faradi. I'm deputy editor of Unheard, the online magazine. Um, and we're here to discuss who is the party of the poor. It's a question that I think gets the heart of the great political realignment going on at the moment, one which there's been a sort of conventional narrative around ever since 2016 in the Brexit vote, one that went straight to 2019 in the, Tory, the general election, which the Tories won, um, and we saw the so-called fall of the Red Wall, um, one that's carried straight through to this year with the Hartlepool by-election, which the Tories also won, um, and straight through to Tory conference, by a Labour conference, a Tory conference remarkable where the lead subject they were talking about was, was this idea of levelling up, where one of the main policy announcements, which everyone got extremely excited about, was the idea that a Tory prime minister um, would be the one putting forward the, raise, the, raise of the rising of the um, minimum wage. Um, that's the conventional narrative. We're here to see whether that's actually the case. Um, I think it's pretty striking that just this week um, we've had a YouGov poll, an MRP poll, it's a really intricate poll that um, predicted the last two elections, um, suggesting that perhaps Red Wall support for the Tories isn't as strong as it might be, and actually Boris's um, control of it is weaker than Theresa May's. We've had the Pandora Papers, um, where a number of senior Tories, including the chairman, um, have been implicated in a number of sleaze scandals. Um, so I think there's certainly a discussion to be had about who is the party of the poor. Is it the Tories? Is it Labour? Or um, is there no such thing as a party of the poor? Um, and then I suppose in tandem with that, what does it mean to be poor today? Well, we've got a panel here um, who will certainly get to the bottom of that. We're slightly depleted. Um, unfortunately, Emily Barley couldn't make it um, because of illness, but we still have four fantastic speakers. Speaking first, we've got Seb Payne on my far left, who is the Financial Times' Whitehall editor. Um, but I suppose, more pertinently to this discussion, is the author of Broken Heartlands, which has just come out and which you must buy. Um, for the research purposes of this book, Seb travelled across the so-called Red Wall um, and spoke to people there. So I'm really hoping that um, what's brilliant about Seb's book is that he manages to get outside of Westminster and actually speak to people up there. Um, so I'm hoping you might be able to provide some insight on that. Speaking second, sitting to my immediate right, we've got Tom Slater, the new editor of Spiked Online, who are kindly sponsoring this session. Tom um, is an all-round, straight-talking, talking head who always has brilliant ideas um, on a range of issues and man always manages to cut through the noise. Speaking third, sitting on my immediate left, we've got Katie Balls, who's the deputy political editor of The Spectator, um, where she also presents the fantastic Women With Balls podcast. Um, and she's also the eye columnist. Um, and then speaking last, but certainly not least, on my far right, I don't think anyone's ever said far right to Morris Glassman in the first sentence, in the same sentence. Um, we have Lord Morris Glassman, who is a Labour peer, the director of the Common Good Foundation, um, and some might say the intellectual heavyweight at the heart of the Blue Labour movement. Seb, would you like to kick us off? Very happy to. Thank you very much. When you look at the 2019 election, which for me was a really seismic one, arguably the most seismic since 1979, you saw such a clear changeover in how England votes. And when we're talking about the poor, we can obviously have a debate about how you define that. But I'm looking at it through the Market Research Society's classic lens of A1B voters and C2D, with C2D being your skilled working class voters. And at the 2019 election, 48% of C2D voters voted Conservative. That is totally unprecedented and is clearly prompted by the Brexit realignment that's happened in society. So on that basis, the answer is, well, of course, the Conservatives are the party of the poor. But the picture is not quite that straightforward. I think a lot of those people who would classify as working class, skilled or unskilled, who voted Conservative, did so because they wanted to, in the words of Boris Johnson, get Brexit done. So it was a very pragmatic vote about trying to end the political chaos, whether they wanted Brexit or not. Um, but I think when you look at what's happened since then, that shift in some ways has continued. Now, um, Jacob mentioned the polling that's come out about the Red Wall and the toy sports sliding there. 
I don't think that's too helpful at the moment. We're in the middle of a parliament. We're not too near a general election. But the Joseph Rowntree Foundation did a big survey that came out quite recently. And these are the, the words of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. The Conservatives are now more popular among people on low incomes than they are among high incomes. In the 2019 election, the Conservatives made gains among low income voters across the whole country in London, the South East, as well as the places that I visited in my book. Now, the reason I say that's obviously linked to the Brexit vote is that generally a lot of surveys that have been done since the referendum suggest that Brexit voters are more likely um, to be poorer. And I think it's about 20 percent point ahead, according to Warwick University. So when you put all that together, I think it's quite clear the Conservatives are becoming the party of the poorer in society. Now, the question is why? Is it policies? Is it attitude? Is it style? And I think it's a combination of all those things. So on the economy, the fact that Boris Johnson has massively pulled the party leftwards, and if you looked at what he'd done at the, at the Conservative Party conference this week, he's plowing money into the NHS while still trying to keep that right flank on board by praising bankers um, and praise, praising private enterprise. So he's trying to straddle both sides there. But I think when you go back to the last election and the sort of mess that Labour got itself into under the Corbyn era, the values were a big problem as well in terms of patriotism, in terms of national institution, in terms of security in society. All the things that the people I met on the tour of, of England uh, that I conducted last year that would normally associate them with the Labour Party, they've all now gone towards the Conservatives. But I don't think this is a permanent change, though. Um, I do think that this was, in 2019, very much... It was born of circumstance. There's been bigger changes in society. Many of the places in the Red Wall, as I write about in the book, it's a third reference, um, have become structurally more conservative. Their economic base are more diverse. Their societies are more individualistic. They're not reliant on one big mine, one big employer in the way they would have been in their 20th century manufacturing prime. That has made them more strictly leaning towards the Tory vote. But I do think there is a danger for the Conservatives here and many of these voters could go back, that traditionally there's always been a bit of class warfare between the rich and poor in this country. When you look at the comments like of Angela Rayner recently, they still want to very much keep that going. And you do get the sense that that thing, there is one rule for them and one rule for the rest of us. If Labour can keep that narrative going and say to people, this is not some bright, shiny, new Johnsonian um, party that is there for the poor, it is actually... Um, the traditional same old Conservative Party, and when you look at things like um, various scandals about Tory donors, and actually encapsulated for me is Barnard Castle. That when that thing happened, when Dominic Cummings broke lockdown rules and went through the country to so many people across it, it felt as if it broke a kind of trust about what the government is there for and created that old perception that this is not a party on our side. My last quick point before I shut up is... When we talk about the poor, a lot of people think of the white working class poor. We should note at the last election that 64% of Britain's BAME community voted for the Labour Party. And within that community, you find some of the poorest in society. So it's a very muddled picture. But at the moment, I would say the Conservatives are the party of the poor. Thanks, Seb. Oh, thank you. Um, so I think the point that at the last election we witnessed a historic class realignment is kind of beyond doubt. How long it will last, like um, Seb says, I have no idea. But I think it's important to reckon with that because on so many different measures, as Seb was saying, there, whether you're looking at the usual social grades, if you're looking at low income, this clear picture emerges, which is the Tories have about 15 point lead over Labour, over what is supposed to be Labour's core vote. And last time I checked, that's still just about holding up as well, despite all of these crises that seem to be enveloping this government. There were some interesting kind of attempts in the wake of 2019 to try and redefine the working class on the part of some Labour activists, basically redefine it as to exclude anyone who voted for the Conservatives, it seemed to me, um, to include middle class millennials who work in publishing and haven't quite managed to convince mum and dad to give them that deposit yet, were also as part of the mix. But there's been so much denialism that this was even a problem, which I think tells you a little bit about how much rot <laughs> had set in. So why were working class people finally repelled by the Labour Party and drawn towards the Conservatives? There's so many different theories and answers to that. There's three things that I think it'd be worth just throwing into the discussion, one of which is that the Tories have a, have a language to talk about aspiration that the Labour Party simply doesn't at all these days. And via this levelling up agenda, as vague 
and as um, sloganistic as it is at this point, manages to have an aspirational message which also isn't as individuated, isn't as Thatcherite as it would have been in the past. It's not necessarily talking about class, but it is talking about community and it's talking about making your life and your family's life and your community's life better in a way that Labour really doesn't have a language to do anymore. I mean, a lot of people in Labour, from top to bottom really, from left to right, kind of talk about the Labour Party as if it's a one giant charitable exercise. You know, it's interested basically in subsistence, it's interested in the welfare state, uh, it's like some kind of NGO which is there to just look after the natives rather than be, you know, the means through which working class interest can be expressed and forwarded. So that's something which I think Labour have completely um, missed in all of this discussion. I mean, in a sense, we're talking about who's the party of the poor. When we talk about the working class, that's a different question as well. I mean, Labour is the party of the poor in many respects because of the fact that they got a big lead amongst unemployed people, for instance. But again, whilst you sh should care about people at the very bottom of society, that sense of working class aspiration has been completely missed in the midst of all of this. The second thing I want to throw in there is the question of identity politics and the cultural war. This is poo-pooed a lot in this discussion. People think that this is purely high information commentators who care about this stuff and that it doesn't um, trickle through at all. I think that's complete and utter nonsense. I think Labour's both embrace of, or at least proximity to, identitarianism is something which is really poisoning the well with a lot of these voters and will continue to do so. I mean, identity politics, first of all, is the antithesis of class politics anyway. I mean, it's trying to suggest that people's, people within the working class's interests are fundamentally different, that their experiences are fundamentally different. Identity politics is also how a lot of class hatred, frankly, is peddled these days. I think whenever we're talking about race or we're talking about gender, the kind of implied villain of the piece is white van man, effectively. Whether they say that ex implicitly, or as Emily Thornberry often took to doing it explicitly, that was very much in there. And I think that What's so fascinating about Keir Starmer is the fact that whilst he's willing to kind of cross so many red lines with his party, whilst he's willing to get himself in trouble by going back on certain things he's pledged or saying things which are taboo with the left, he still can't bring himself to say only women have a cervix. It's really fascinating that even amongst the kind of sensible, electable section of the party that they are very much um, in with this kind of new elite identity politics. And the final thing to chuck in there, which seems obvious, and Seb's already talked about it, is the question of Brexit. And I bring that up because there has been an attempt to kind of pretend that that never happened. You know, Keir Starmer trying to pretend like he wasn't the architect of the second referendum policy. Corbyn Easter's trying to pretend that they didn't get behind that campaign in the end. They just act like it was all Andrew Adonis's idea <laughs> at this point, which is complete nonsense. And I think... I think people are going to remember that historic betrayal that the 2019 manifesto represented. You had millions of working class people vote to leave the European Union and then their party, the Labour Party, stand on a platform of making them vote again. This is so fundamental. You would hear Labour commentators say, well, Labour leavers are, you know, they're not that bothered about it. But in the aftermath of Brexit, it wasn't even about the EU anymore. It was about democracy. And a point that Tony Benn used to make was the vote matters more to working class people than it does to anyone else. Because if you don't have a lot of money, the vote means a lot more to you. So this is something which I think really can't be papered over. At the last election, the working class, made, having made a blow for independence from the European Union, made a blow for independence from the Labour Party. And to be perfectly frank, I think the Labour Party completely deserved the drubbing that was meted out on them. And long may it continue. Thanks, Tom. Lots there to unpack. Um, I think this idea of class is going to be one that keeps coming up. Um, I mean, we've called the session "Who is the Party of the Poor," but I think it's interesting to um, you know also have that class element, and it's class politics is important as well. Um, Katie, over to you. So interesting remarks from um, Seven Tom so far. I think just picking up on a few of those. I mean, having just spent the past fortnight in Brighton and then Manchester at Labour conference and then Tory conference. I think it's interesting because we're talking about that 2019 election result, uh, what it showed and where we moved on. But there was actually much on show just a few weeks ago as to why we're currently we're in the situation we're in, where we've heard every panellist talk about 2019 showed that shift of the Tories being the party of the poor, at least temporarily, and Labour moving really away from what was originally their core base. And Labour conference was ultimately walking around various fringes where the party was fighting with each other, mainly talking to each other 
mainly talking to each other. When Keir Starmer did do an interview, what trended was cervix on Twitter um, because it became about uh, all these identity politics issues. And uh, then also the other big headline was Angela Rayner so su- suggesting that Tories were scum. And I think that it means that you do have this sense that the party isn't really focusing on the country and is more focusing on each other. And I think that, again, just adds to the sense that, uh, you know, what are you doing which is actually helping other people who vote for you? I think in Boris Johnson's case, there's plenty of reasons to say his government is currently not helping the people it claims to help. But you do see in every Boris Johnson interview and also in response to every negative Boris Johnson story, you know, this is a Westminster bubble story. This is not what the people of this country care about. We are the people's government. And even that slogan, which is, you know, we're getting on with the job, getting the job done. I think the messaging is far more disciplined than Labour. I think that Labour can't quite work out if it wants to keep fixing internal matters or, you know, uh, get involved in these various uh, identity politics debates, which often just do become, you know, rabbit holes or move to something else. Whereas Boris Johnson's team are, are much better, even talking about higher wages. There's lots of unease at the Tory party conference about inflation. Can you really take shortages of lorry drivers and say that this is going to be brilliant for uh, working class voters in the next few months because they're going to get higher wages? You can say it. There's lots of factors outside of your control, which means it could be a lot more, a lot more disruptive. Um, and it could soon be that we're all spending so much money in terms of our cost of living that any wage hike doesn't really feel very substantial at all um, but you can see that language I think that's something that Labour has been lacking now um, particularly under Keir Starmer but before that too um, and something they need to fix if they are going to start to address some of these problems in terms of how they communicate in terms of the Tories move I think to uh, you know that 2019 election victory it began under Theresa May it also went wrong under Theresa May. <laughs> um, but we did have the gist about managing. And I think that the gist about managing was very poorly defined. It drove civil servants insane because they just didn't know exactly what group they were talking about. Um, but I do, do think it was starting to say, well, you know, all these people who might have one person in the family on universal credit, one person working, you're the gist about managing and, you know, we want to do something for you. Now, clearly in that election, dementia tax, others, people start to really feel so the Tories were not on their side because it hurt them financially what the government was offering. And I think that is where there is a risk to the Conservative government right now in terms of its claim to be the party for the poor because we have seen many crises bounce off Boris Johnson. I think that all commentators probably have to look at themselves in the times that they have said, and probably myself included here, you know, this is what's going to do it. And then it's Tories 27, <laughs> Labour 5. Um, that's an exaggeration. But, you know, those polls come out and you don't see you know, it having that effect. But I think where, if we're bringing things to the present day, Boris Johnson faces a problem is we are heading towards a cost of living crisis. It is more complicated than any one single fit thing. It's known as the effing crisis in government, energy, fuel and food, not swearing. And um, in that sense, how does Boris Johnson spin your way out of something like that? And I think we can see a few attempts to do it. But if we have a situation where voters going into the next election feel measurably poorer, feel as though the tax rises that the government have brought in, which, yes, poll fine right now, but haven't yet been brought into effect, and that's going to be next year, start to actually affect what they're able to do. I do think that's when Labour could have an opportunity, they could seize it to start to say, actually, for all the bluster and the talk, this government is not on your side. You're levelling down, not levelling up. And I think that's the real risk, in my opinion, for whether the Tories can keep saying they're either the party of the poor or the working class, depending how we define it. Thanks, Casey. Morris? Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and and good to see you. Um, I'm just, I've been he- hearing what you're saying. I think it's, I mean, Tom, in terms of this thing about democracy and Brexit, I think that's absolutely fundamental. And that is the rupture that, that happened. Um, and I think it's completely correct. If you just talk about the poor, um, on the whole, the poor don't vote. That's the first thing. So, um, and if you look at the, the party that got the most votes from the poor, it was in the end probably Labour. So it's a class issue. It's a fundamentally a class issue. 
and it also relates to two other things which is uh, property ownership and the second thing is education so one thing you could definitely say is that the Labour Party is the party of the graduate right that's that's really fundamental it's the party of the city uh, and not the small town and um, and, and these are the fundamental distinctions and the Conservatives are um, when I looked at the data Seb it was the party of the not very um, not very expensive property owner mm. so th it was a property owning class but if you looked at who owned really expensive homes they voted Labour I mean the classic thing is that is that Labour um, won Putney which is the third highest property ownership of uh, uh, wealthiest in the country and lost 70 seats across mm. the areas uh, that you've looked at including Blythe and Grimsby I mean these are absolutely heartland um, heartland areas so I completely agree Tom that Labour's put itself into a frenzy to try and show the data that that uh, the poor did not vote Conservative but what is definitely the case is that people who understood themselves to be working class voted Conservative so in, in their in their self-understanding and I think that absolutely the issue um, was Brexit. I think you're right about the uh, identitarian stuff. I got a, a brilliant text. I worked with Labour Friends of the Forces, a group of Labour veterans who were really committed. And and at party conference, they just texted me and said, you know, what are we supposed to say to our mates? You know, thank you for your cervix. Um, <laughs> And that's roughly how it's being. It's like a bizarre alternative universe where where these things are um, are being discussed. So so um, and what Tom said has got to be reiterated really fundamentally is that the fundamental um, inheritance of the working class is the vote, is democracy itself, and the renunciation and the threat of the renunciation of that democratic legitimacy. I've found, um, said, was absolutely fundamental in this new class realignment. So there is a class realignment. I'll take it, I'll take that very seriously. So for example, someone who I've worked with for seven, eight years on trying to uh, develop um, economic ideas that would redistribute assets, power um, to the regions was Andy Haldane, who was the chief economist of the Bank of England. And, an institutional model built around, you know, because over the last 40 to 50 years, and I think this is the central thing I'm saying, is that the Brexit period, let's say, to use Gramscian terms, was an interregnum. It was a time in between times. It was all in the balance. That's what made it so scary. There was a huge, there was a fundamental change of time and era going on. And we were moving um, away from the period of of uncritical globalization, you know, and by uncritical globalization, I mean the EU and what it had become after Lisbon, which was based on the free movement of labor, free movement of labor, goods, services, and capital. So there was a un uncritical acceptance of, of the movement of labor. That was one aspect. There was a technological determinism that you couldn't do anything about it, that politics was utterly subordinate technology 30 seconds oh no <laughs> okay i'm going to negotiate a minute and a half okay so, <laughs> so this minutes. is the really thing that i wanted to share is is that all of that was back and then what you might call a member state or liberal state that there was a state that enforced these rights but the state was not responsive to democracy that was the crucial thing that there was nothing you could do about this the new era that we're in has a much more powerful role for the nation state as an economic actor. Right? That's, I mean, COVID has absolutely reinforced that, but that's the new era. The second is, which is incomprehensible to labor, which is the tragedy that I live through, is that it's the working class that's the decisive force in elections, that the working class is the agent but they built their whole last 40 years on denying that. So the first is was the acceptance of globalization as a fate. The second was the irrelevance of the working class. And the third thing is the places that they live were 
So what you have is the Conservatives way ahead in understanding the contours of the new era, far more free to renounce their historical commitment to globalisation, finance. Um, you've, um, you've, you've seen all of that. Um, and Labour still trapped in the previous era. This is the fundamental issue. So I think that what we now are witnessing, yeah, I've got it, I'm, I'm off the pitch, <laughs> is, is the con Conservatives moving from a dominant position from the election victory. And if they can deal, Katie, with the levelling up in a serious way, um, then they will become hegemonic. And that's the era because they have understood the power of the working class, which, if you think of that from a Labour perspective, is kind of tragic. Thanks, Murray. <laughs> right, we're going to come straight out to the audience. Lots there to unpack. I mean, we've had a lot of discussion there about Labour and the Tories. It'd be interesting to know if anyone has any other suggestions for who's the party of the working class, or the work, Lord Paul. Or is this, is this our lot? I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Though? We talk about Brexit quite a lot. Um, already. But I mean, let's not forget that since 2016, we've had the Brexit Party um, doing rather well um, among working class voters, particularly in that one election. Um, and there are new mov movements now, like Reclaim and the SDP, which are also slowly getting momentum. Um, or perhaps I'm just being naive. And I suppose the other question which we're yet to answer is should there be a party of the working class? Um, I'd be interested to hear if anyone has any thoughts on that. Um, but anyway, over to you guys. At the Conservative Party, conference recently, apparently Liz Truss was going to get up and say only women have a cervix. But apparently she was told by Tory HQ, and no, you are not going to say that. And I actually think that illustrates the duplicity of the Tory party at the moment, because I think on the one hand, the Tory party actually do well electorally in terms of soaking up ordinary people's frustration with which they see as officiousness, authoritarian politics, um, sort of driven through woke values. And I think the Conservative Party are often seen as a buffer against that. But at the same time as that is happening, behind the scenes, the Tory party is still actually playing that particular game. Right? If you take a look at something like Ofsted, something that the Conservative Party are in control of, and you actually look at their recommendations for school inspections, it might as well be written by trans activists like Freddie McConnell, right? Uh, so my question to the panel, how long can this duplicity last with the Conservative Party? Because they have become a safety valve for people's frustration with woke authoritarianism, and they play a, sim, um, a similar role to social democracy in the 1970s. Social democracy was a safety valve uh, for working class people's frustrations um, in the workplace. And I think in the 21st century, the Tory party are playing a similar safety valve role in politics. But how long is that going to last? Because the more that the Tory party play this dishonest duplicity with the electorate, when, is, when are they going to be... Uh, become unstuck with that sort of process. Thank you. I'll be a bit honest, I've got my hand on my heart and say the truth that in Westminster there is really no party for the working poor or the Tory poor. And it's true to say, uh, I'm sorry to, to criticise Labour, but many Labour councils have carried out cuts in public services and left front and centre. Uh, and as for the 2019 general election, well, there was a betrayal of voters' trust. I'm afraid we should have, although I campaigned for the European Union, we agreed to say in there. I recognise the referendum result. We shouldn't go against it. We shouldn't have a second referendum. We should recognise the people's votes. And that was a brutal and political suicide, I think, for the Labour Party in the general election. We should have done, should have done a second referendum. But I'm saying the current government, uh, the same as you represent the working poor, I've never seen so many cuts in universal credit. I've never seen so many workers driven out of uh, nationalised industries. I've never seen so many uh, jobs being lost. Uh, in actual fact, we've lost all the three main political party votes in Scotland as well. Um, so that's why we've done very badly through generations, decades, of austerity that's going to break up the United Kingdom, which is very dangerous and frightening. Um, I would be honest and say there isn't a party in Westminster that represents the working poor and the unemployed poor from a trading perspective. 
In terms of um, a party of the poor, I think it's very much the case that it's a Labour Party who is a party of talking about the poor, but I'm afraid they do so in a particular way. So it's mainly Labour Party people who talk about betting shops being in poor, uh, poor districts of, of the city, and, that's, and they say that's very, very bad. You know, they talk about universal credit cut, they talk about free school meals. So they do very much talk about poor and poverty, but they do it in a particular way, which is either critical of the area in, wh in which working class or poor people live, or they do it in a charitable, patronising way, you know, occasionally. And, uh, and, and that, I think, is very, very problematic. Thank you. I want to say that I don't think there is, or indeed there can be really, a party of the poor. People support of, by definition, a small portion, we hope, of the people of the country. And therefore being a party of the poor is a recipe for never getting into power. I do want to call out some members of the panel for conflating working class and poor, actually. Mm -hmm. Right, Morris, one minute on that would be great, thank you. Okay, so to the, to the first speaker I say, he's just given me a great idea of, that Labour's moved from, you could say, from the work, social democracy has gone from the workplace to the woke place. I think that's <laughs> quite a good way of conceptualising um, something. Um, and, in, and in terms of, you know, it's just important not to underestimate the extent to which um, we're still living in an unresolved interregnum in, in, in this way is that within the public sector, within the universities, um, these ideas that could be summarised in terms of, of woke, but the emancipation of the individual from all constraints is, is incredibly powerful still. And I don't really see where the, um, where the resistance comes from that. So I think there is a complete incoherence in the government on that. Um, in terms of what you're saying, uh, you know, you've just got to take it on trust that I'm very sympathetic to, to what you're saying. But it is incredible to me that, that, the, that the Conservative government is more comfortable with concepts of capital and labour than labour. This is the thing I really wanted to share, is that they're talking about areas of the country that have been deprived of capital, all the building societies when all the banks centralised within London. There's incredibly little capital there. And they're beginning, they're beginning at least rhetorically to address that. And then the degradation of labour, you know, this move um, to, towards that. And, and it's just an astonishing feature of our time that labour is so reluctant to engage and wants to talk all the time about values. And this is my response to rather than interests. And the crucial thing was to how do you conceptualise the labour interest? And the huge issue to go back to what we said before was that people understood completely, working class people understood completely that unless they had democracy, their interests would be ignored, that, that there would be a huge number of other factors calculated in terms of the values, including the priority of the poorest, that would diminish their organised power. So that's my initial reply. Thanks, Morris. Katie, any thoughts there? Just pick up one and jump on it. Yeah, I mean, I'll go to the question about this trust at the start. Now, I don't know if, um, I have no knowledge on whether that is the case regarding what she was planning to say in a speech, but I just think more broadly on that question of the valve is, is are the Tories almost trying to say one thing and do another on culture war issues? I think that Boris Johnson's approach to culture wars has always been, you know, to kind of almost wait for his opponent to overstep as far as he sees it mm -hmm. and then step in. So you wait for, you know, uh, whether it's Keir Starmer taking the knee, whether it's, you know, going for Winston Churchill, the statue, some statues, I think the government are more relaxed about coming down, and then you make your bold statement. And I think we could see at Tory party conference that there are some areas Boris Johnson quite wants to have the culture war fight, that being statues, history, um, the BBC. I think Nadine Doris's appointment is a sign that they want to have a very loud fight, even if they don't actually privatise the BBC, to show that they, you know, to play that with the base. But I think on trans issues, there's a very clear sign that the government does not want to go really near that at all. Um, I think you can see it through what Boris Johnson said. I think you can see it um, partly in the fact that Boris Johnson's wife spoke at a LGBT uh, plus reception. I think that they've decided that is not one of the fights they want to go near. So I think 
think in terms of is that going to create a, you know, a backlash amongst its base, it really comes down to how far do you want the culture wars to go? I think that Boris Johnson's drawing a parameter and there are some in his party who would like it to go much further. Um, but then you also have all these Tory MPs in the South and it touches on this point about you know, what's happened to conservatism. There's lots of Tory MPs in the South who don't want to get anywhere near any of this. They want to have this one nation conservatism. So um, I think there are limits to how far the Tory government will go on this. Um, and it's just a question as to whether people who want them to go further have anywhere else to go. Thanks, Katie. Tom, anything to add on? Yeah, I just want to pick up on that point about Tory duplicity on the culture war as well, because I think that's that's very well made. As Katie was saying, um, Boris Johnson doesn't have to do much to appear anti-woke these days. That's one thing. Things have gotten so mad that if you just say that you don't want to tear down Winston Churchill's statue, that it almost becomes a kind of interesting position for a um, politician <laughs> to hold at this point. But that duplicity is a problem because whilst for the minute I think the Tory party can at least be interpreted as the more anti-woke of the two um, or certainly not as more distance from it, um, these issues really matter. The, the, there's a tendency to talk about the cultural as if it's something that uh, at worst is just this kind of frippery that people are getting too upset about when really there's nothing there or that it's something that you kind of need to ignore so that you can talk about the real issues. There's a sort of tendency, even amongst nominally anti-woke people, if you want to call it that, to um, frame it in that way. But these issues actually really matter materially. First of all, because I think the culture war is often a class war by proxy. I mean, it's a war on the values held by the vast majority of people in this country, for instance, oftentimes. Uh, it has discussions around gender identity have a material impact on how health services um, operate as material all of these different discussions have material impact on freedom of speech on how we understand reality all of these things are really really important and the Tories cowardice on this therefore is a problem and I can only imagine will become more of a problem for them down the line and it's always worth remembering that so much of the discussion in recent years in this area has been around the Gender Recognition Act this was Theresa May's work <laughs> people forget this um, and so that's something which I think will come back to bite them. And if anything demonstrates that Boris Johnson is a um, particularly uneasy leader of a nominally slightly more working class party, it's not the fact that he went to Eton or his middle name's the Feffel, it's the fact that on a lot of these woke issues, he does have, if not sympathy with those perspectives, he's terrified of the backlash that would come from challenging some of them. Thanks, Tom. Seb, anything you want to pick up on? Yeah, I just actually want to mention something that Morris mentioned much earlier on when we were talking about home ownership versus education. And I think this shows how complicated this debate is, that those who were less likely to have university education voted conservative the last election, yet homeowners were much more likely to vote conservative, that it was about 45% of social renters voted um, Labour at the last election. So that definition is not easy at all. Some of the things from the floor there, and um, the fellow at the back talked about Tory duplicity, um, the Tory party's been doing that for about sort of 200 odd years of just <laughs> making everybody's head spin by going from one policy to another. I have absolutely no doubt they will pivot from one thing to another. So they will talk of Winston Churchill's statue and then go in a very different direction to keep other voters in different parts of the country in mind there. Um, to the chap from about the trade union movement here, um, I think I think there's a wider problem with the trade union movement and where, which part of society it represents, that over the past couple of decades, trade unions have become increasingly focused on the public sector and increasingly f not focused on, as I mentioned, those kind of new industries, the gig economy that have come up, which often have some of the poorest in society. Now, I think the GMB union's actually been very effective in getting rights for Uber drivers, for example, so they have worked for that part of it, but I think there's other big parts of society it doesn't, so I think there's responsibility on both sides there. And when you talked about um, cuts in terms of universal credit and things, that's all through the lens of the state there. And I think you've got to remember that the bottom of society, it comes back to the point someone was making about aspiration on the panel, that it's not just about what the government does and what money the government is spending, it's about what society does and the structures you have there. Um, and then... Sure. Okay. Well, that's what we, we can sort of read stiff on that one. And then I think the final point as well is about, um, uh, I'm trying to read my own note here. Yes, this point about whether there should be a party of the poor. Look, all political parties are coalitions in a way. And, you know, the, the fact the Conservative Party is representing some of the poorest in society, that's not necessarily a new thing. If you go back to the 1980s when Margaret Thatcher won that whole generation of people through their right to buy their council houses, 
that just shows it didn't just start in 2017, as Katie was right, when those UKIP voters, and, and that's actually, I think, a lot of this break started, that a lot of people started to leave Labour over the values issues in 2009, 2010, 2015, broke away. And then when they came back home to the Conservatives, that's when they sort of did pretty well there. And there's the last quick point I want to make as well. Very quick. Very quick. On the levelling up agenda, which again, we're starting to get a bit more form about what that's going to look like and what that's going to feel. I think this is the great thing about politics at the moment. It's one of the reasons I spent a year writing a book about it, is that we're now talking about towns. We're talking about people who have felt disenfranchised by the political system, who have voted a particular way due to tribal loyalty. They're now at the front of our conversation. And the fact we're talking about levelling up, we're looking at the long-term effects of deindustrialization. I think it's an absolutely wonderful thing, and it's a good thing for all of our politics. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, kind of along those lines. I mean, I, I think to some extent we've started to have a conversation about who represents <coughs> the poor, but I think maybe there's potentially more meat in having a conversation about who, who responds to the poor the most, because I think one of the elements that is increasingly disappointing about the tenor of political discourse is that it, it seems to often really only exist at the level of, of something that you can put a pound sign on. And on the one hand, yes, it's absolutely the case that um, this Tory party is a lot more open to public spending in ways that it never could. But if that's all they've got, if it's only pork barrel politics, if levelling up has no aspirational content beyond I'm just going to fucking chuck some money wherever I can, um, then... No one's, there is no representation, really, and, and that stuff can never really be trusted to come back to anyone that, that we might think matters or should shape political life. And my second very quick question is, with everything that we've said, um, does this only hold in England, really? Because I think the union question is an increasingly important one, splitting people's political discussion. Two really interesting questions there. The question about the nature of the, the Red Wall is not just an anthropological question, because I live there. Um, I actually grew up between Rotherham and Doncaster, and then I left that area. Um, I was very fortunate to go out to the States and make some money, and I'd actually come back, and I lived back in the place I grew up. And I was away for two and a half, three decades. It was more clear when I came back to how little had changed. These were working class communities in which work had gone, and very, very little seemed to have been done to help anybody in those communities, certainly in my absence, that's not connected to those physically. Um, so it seems to me we've talked a lot about um, the, the demographics of voters in that area and the demographics of the poor. I think what we really need to focus on is what is the offer to those people. One of the things that was very clear to me, I can tell you I'm probably one of the only people who's spent a bunch of time in venture capital and is now a merchant banker who sits in the pub in Doncaster, um, talking to people about life in general. And they are absolutely, the people to whom I speak, generalizing or not, are absolutely not interested one bit in any of the stuff that people there that I speak to refer to as that woke shit. What they're interested in is where is work going to come from, where is investment going to come from, where are jobs going to come from, and not so much the party of the poor, but the party for the poor, because nobody wants to stay poor. <clears throat> Woke is one thing, but I always thought the party of the poor is the party which is the least green, which has a least green agenda, because the greens, per definition, um, you know, tend to annoy uh, poor people by uh, making energy more expensive, um, uh, railing against cheap flights and so on. And in continental Europe, at least, you can definitely see that with the yellow vests when Macron brought up, you know, poorer voters against him, middle class, poor middle class voters. So I was wondering what you had to say about that. And then, um, Lord Glassman, I actually read your book, which was, I think, your dissertation, when you talk about the, um, the, uh, the democ democratizing of, of the economy. And I was wondering if, you know, if you could say a few words on, on that as well. Thank you. Hi, sorry. Um, I was just um, referring, um, the particular questions on the culture wars in the Labour Party. So on the culture wars, I just, I, I didn't want to caution against the sort of anti-woke woke narrative. I think it's actually, it does a conversation a bit to serve the service and actually uh, reduces a lot of nuance in, on the issue. I mean, Katie made a point on the Gender Recognition Act, but I know that there are many, for example, socially liberal, uh, one nation Tory MPs, uh, Margot James, for example, the MP in Guildford, whose name I forgot, who, who take 
a much more critical line, whereas if you look at, for example, Crispin Blunt, who uh, is a uh, Brexiteer, uh, he's very pro it. Or if you look at, for example, race, you've got people like Stephen Baker, who, uh, you know, devout Christian, but very, very strongly uh, for conservative anti-racist, but he's also obviously the leader of this party. So I think there does need to be a lot more nuance in the discussion. I do think the media um, and a lot of them in the commentariat don't actually understand the nuances around these issues and just think woke, anti-woke, that's it. It just needs many, for example, progressive people in private who might say some things which, you know, they'll go the whole hog, you know, they're not exactly going to be, you know, GBE, but they're going to say some things which, you know, might not fit the narrative. And I do think in these conversations that does need to be explored. Yes, I just wanted to um, speak to the panel about the effect of momentum and how momentum... I think it was formed around 2000, just after uh, Corbyn's second coup, I think it was. Um, of course, the fourth coup was Corbyn cooing himself uh, more than anything. But the effect of momentum as a middle class organisation uh, basically coming into the Labour Party, uh, coming into the Labour Party after the Brexit uh, vote and the effect that momentum has actually had in changing the Labour Party from a set, a, basically a, a working class party to middle class concerns around Brexit and a democratic vote. So I'd just like to ask that. Thank you. I'm going to bring it back to the panel now, but you're going first as soon as I come back. Um, Seb, I'm going to start with you yeah. this time. Do you want to pick up on anything there? I mean, I think, I think this idea of who, you know, which party would benefit the poor mm. as opposed to who says they represent them is really interesting. I think it's probably worth getting into a bit of a discussion on that as well. But um, if there's anything else you want to pick up on, that's fine too. Thanks. Well, to come to the chap at the back there who made the point about, um, you know, what are they actually going to do for these first-time Tory voters across England? I think you're completely right. It's not just about throwing money at them because when I did the travels around England, every single Labour MP who lost their seat could give you a list this long of all the projects they did. Hospitals, roads, schools, plaques, you name it, it's all there. And they still lost their seats. So ultimately, I don't think money is the answer here. It's got to be a more fundamental structural change in terms of jobs, in terms of skills. And, you know, I hate to sound like some, you know, like the Prime Minister here, but it's about opportunity, right? It's about what, what you can do to make sure you do get those changes there. Um, on the union question, of course, it's very, very different in Scotland and Wales here. That Wales has actually had a bit of a resurgence in the recent Senate elections, but the Tories have made similar gains among the working class parts of Wales, particularly on the north coast there. Uh, in Scotland, you know, the SNP just win everyone, really, don't they? Um, it, it was of all classes and all s and of left and right there, based on their kind of nationalist impulses. Um, to the question of the fellow here, who um, is a brilliant combination, investment banking and Doncaster, I think that's, uh, that's one way of levelling up the country. Um, I think you're right that, you know, this is the point I've tried to make, which is that these places, I think they have changed. They don't have those monolithic industries and their communities are not collectivised in the way they once were, which intrinsically ties them into labour and into the trade union movement. But I think they obviously do need some kind of new offer. And fundamentally, I think whether you talk about culture, work issues, whatever it is, what people want in these places, they just want better jobs, better wealth, better life chances. And I think that goes back for several generations. Um, I think the thing about culture wars being nuanced is certainly very true. And I think Katie's point earlier about Boris Johnson speaks to this. That there's a lot of people within this government who do love to really set the hair running on this, you know, Oliver Dowden, the chairman of the Tory party, was saying that, you know, he loves talking up this stuff, but the prime minister who sets the tone is much more restrained there. Um, to find the lady who talked about momentum here, um, I think it's actually less about that than more about when you look at Labour MPs. If you think of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, literally everybody at the top of his party came in one square mile of Islington. They were all bordering on the same MPs. Many of them had been in London politics their whole lives. And then when they're thrown to this question about Brexit, about Remain, about the needs of the rest of the country, you, know, you can say, why is it such a surprise that they're in this situation there? And Kistama's 
trying to bring a bit more geographic diversity. You know, you've obviously got Angela Rayner, you've got Lisa Nandy, who mm. represent different parts of the problems. But I think it's certainly true that as Labour has grown under the Corbyn era, its activists have become much more metropolitan. And I think it was in, in my book, Andy Burnham talks about city Labour versus town Labour. And constituency Labour parties in towns are much more the kind you would traditionally think about, whereas in cities they're bigger, but they've certainly got one kind of aspect. And what's interesting from the Labour conferences the rule change they pass, it's not necessarily about who's going to be the next leader. It's the trigger ballots for MPs because a lot of Labour MPs spent months and months trying to fight off um, insurgencies from momentum. I think Dinah Johnston Hull spent four and a half months just entirely trying to save her seat there. Whereas now they've raised the threshold for trigger ballots, Labour MPs think they can move away from the Corbyn policy platform and not have to worry about those kind of activists. Thanks, Seb. Tom, um, I was wondering if you might want to tackle that question about climate politics mm. and whether that's sort of re to replace um, the notion of class politics. Any mm. thoughts? No, definitely. I think I also want to tie it in with that point that was made <coughs> about how the Corbyn years made the party more thoroughly middle class than it was previously, despite supposedly it being put on a more kind of classically kind of pro-worker footing. Um, I mean, the Labour Party membership is something like 75% ABC1. Uh, John Curtis said that during the Corbyn years he basically finished what Blair started in relation to turning it into that and it's just absolutely fascinating another thing that Corbynistas really can't digest and when we talk about the chasm between the Labour Party and working class voters on any of these issues uh, woke issues the question of Brexit um, even some of the questions around climate change I would argue which is becoming more and more of an issue it's downstream from the fact that its class base has changed essentially um, and that's something that I think is worth Bearing in mind, I mean, even when we talk about um, ethnic minority voters, um, working class people, including ethnic minority people, are not woke <laughs> in any meaningful sense. And this is something which um, will, is increasingly um, a problem for Labour and it's not going anywhere. And it ties in with the point made about climate as well, which again, I think, is the Achilles heel, in the, if, amongst many Achilles heels, to be perfectly frank, in this Boris Johnson government, is this enthusiastic embrace of net zero. Now, there's no challenge to that, of course, in Parliament, but nevertheless, this is effectively a programme that will impoverish the country, that will hit working class people hardest. The, the Treasury's own estimates, which haven't been published but reported in the Telegraph about six months ago, spell this out, that the cost of net zero, the brunt of it will be borne by the working class. And you're going to see, even if it's not a street protest response, as we saw in France, you're certainly going to see an electoral response to that, the more that that starts to bite. Because, you know, the Yellow Vest had this great slogan, which is, you're worried about the end of the world, we're worried about the end of the month. And that's going to become more and more clear in people's minds, I think. Thanks, Tom. Morris, is there one point you want to pick up on there? I wonder whether, I mean, the idea that the chap in the back made there about whether this is just a British phenomenon or not, I think is particularly interesting. Um, anything you've got to say on that? What do you think that it's a European-wide or worldwide problem? Well, we know that, that capitalism works um, the same way everywhere, but the political responses are different everywhere, and it's helped you build um, a politics around resistance, essentially to the commodification of human beings and of nature, actually. That those are the um, central things. So I've, I've got to... Go, there's, a, there's a few things to, um, to say in, in response to this, that... The first is to just say that there is a, in the levelling up stuff, Katie, there is a new word around, which is covenant, which hasn't been used for a very long time, covenant, not contract. Now, if you think that a Conservative government is now talking about covenantal economics, covenantal politics, what does that mean? That first of all means that there's going to be some intergenerational component, and that means binding to the past, which um, is off limits, for progressive or liberals, and then also, you know, leaving institutions into the future. I think it's it's a very um, in interesting interesting thing in terms of what the what the woman said about momentum. From sort of my perspective and you know, Blue Labour perspective, New Labour and momentum were virtually identical. I mean, this is real. They were both liberal fundamentally. They were both urban, completely based in cities. They both hated Brexit, and they all really are hostile to democracy. They don't. There's some value higher than democracy, which is basically being faithful to your social science graduate course. I don't know what the value <laughs> is, but but whatever it is, 
they don't talk to people and they don't talk to people in pubs in Rotherham and they don't hear what's being said. They really don't. So, I mean, I really had to go with Labour. Bought a lot of community organiser called Arnie Graf over. He was a fantastic organiser and he was very technical. And the average length of time he told me it took between a member of the Labour Party talking to the public and telling them that they were wrong, right, <laughs> was eight seconds. <laughs> uh, uh, if you want data, it, they couldn't hold it. They couldn't. They couldn't. Couldn't hold it. No, you're wrong. About it's about. It's about. We go do it instinctively towards. No, it's about cuts. It's about austerity. But people were talking about immigration, or they were talking about housing. You couldn't hear. It's this. So both of them were were deeply, um, deeply unrelational in that way. Out of relationship with people, and this is the thing, I'm working in Grimsby a lot at the moment, Grimsby, a minute and a half. Very quickly. Grimsby's a... Eight seconds. But Grimsby <laughs> was forever Labour, I mean forever Labour um, in the council and in the MPs. It's now got seven and a half thousand Tory majority, the council is 22-7, just, I mean, this death in the heart of your, of your land, it, it, it's an extraordinary thing. And, and they may, just, just to share with you, and may shed light on, on the Conservatives of Boris, everybody I've spoken to there makes this distinction, and forgive my language, between shit happens and out of order, right? And shit happens is, is what they think, you know, oh, God, COVID, shit happens, you know, oh, dear. dear that. But when it comes to Brexit, it was out of order. This was completely out of order because there'd been a vote. Right, and then when it comes to... I'm going to stop you there, Mark. Yeah, there go. Thank you. No, no, you'll have another chance. Casey, is there anything you want to pick up on there? Yeah, um, a few points. I mean, um, to the man who, um, above uh, who was talking about um, the Gender Recognition Act, I completely agree. The, the cultural issues, I think, to, just to suggest it's simplistic is wrong. It's much more nuanced. Um, just on the trans rights issue, the point I was trying to make is that there was clearly lots of different opinions in the party. Now, there are lots of, and you mentioned some of them, there are lots of Tory women, some Tory men, who really believe in women's only spaces, and that's part of the debate. But there's also a group of MPs who, when Keir Starmer says, you know, anyone, you don't have to have a cervix to be a woman, um, they want attack ads, and they want saying, you know, he said this, look who he is. And I think that's very far away from what the Prime Minister wants to do, and I think it's going to be much softer than that, even if they, if, even if they take the fight. On the Scotland point, um, I'm from Scotland, don't particularly sound it, thanks to my English parents, um, <laughs> but lived there my whole life. And I think that it's really interesting to me that when the UK Westminster government, so figures like Michael Gove, think about a Scottish recovery and stopping the SNP, they're not really thinking of Douglas Ross, they're thinking of Scottish Labour. And I think the fact that uh, you hear ministers privately saying they want Scottish Labour to do well points to the fact that I don't think this conversation um, and some of the things we're talking about the Tory party doing passes over to Scotland. I think it is seen as a different demographic in terms of those voters. I don't think that's, you know, again, it's simplistic to say it's completely different, but I, I do think it is seen as a, a different approach is needed and that therefore to do, for, to have a pro-union message, I think that actually most Tories want Scottish Labour to prosper. And then I would just go quickly on the green agenda point, which is, I think it's really interesting chairing a few panels at Tory conference did one with um, uh, a business leader, and he made the point that uh, actually the UK is quite rare in the sense that every mainstream party is pro the green agenda. It's not become a left and right issue as it has in quite a few European um, neighbours. And I think that's interesting because it does feel sometimes like we're living in a different universe when you hear ministers talk about the cost of net zero and say it's going to be great for everyone, green jobs, green jobs. Um, and then we read reports, you know, about this green levy on bills on energy at a time when energy bills are going to soar for reasons outside of the government's control. So I think there is a cost coming. I think it's disingenuous, the current co conversation. It's not to say the green agenda is a bad thing. You can argue it's a good thing. But I don't think people are being upfront about it. And I think that's going to have a kickback. My question is, given Labour's position is that the Tory government should go faster on net zero, what is your alternative? Is it the Reform Party? At the moment, you know, that's on about four points, I think, in the polls. So I think until there is an alternative base, and it is something Tory strategists are worried about, they do think a 
you know, an anti, uh, the cost of net zero party combined with low taxes does have a market, perhaps a bit like the Brexit party, but until it exists, I do wonder, you know, whether that's just something, again, the government will manage to get away with for a lack of opposition. Do you think, I'm sorry, just while I've got you, I mean, do you, how likely do you think that is? Uh, a rival party? Yeah. Well, I, I think we have to remember, a large part of the reason Boris Johnson is Prime Minister is the Brexit Party. Um, it completely changed the debate in politics um, over that Brexit deal. It meant that the Tories had to rethink, and it meant they didn't go for other candidates. I think they went for someone which, at the time, lots of the Parliamentary Party didn't like. So I think there's a chance for it. I think you probably need a Nigel Farage-style leader to have an impact, and it's not going to so much, in my view, being a about winning seats in Parliament. We know how hard that is, but about shifting the debate. But it takes a lot to get right, and we're seeing the difficulties of reforms currently having. So to be very boring, I think there's a chance, but I wouldn't bet lots of money on it. Yeah. Seb, you want to come in very, very quickly? You've got yeah. I, I, well, I was going to mention Reform UK, which obviously came out of the Brexit Party, which came out of UKIP, and I went to their side conference in Manchester for one day. And on policy terms, you can see the intellectual space they should occupy there for more libertarian voters who don't like the sort of the, the, the more liberal edge of what Boris Johnson is doing. But I actually think it all just comes down to leadership here. Why did UKIP break through the first past the post system? In, not in terms of parliament, but in terms of getting the votes that shaped the debate, that pushed David Cameron into that referendum that then went on to shape Boris Johnson winning the Tory party leadership. It was pretty much all because of Nigel Farage, who is obviously once in a generation campaigner and very, very effective. Um, with all due respect, I don't think Richard Tice is that figure. He's not proven effective in doing that. If there was someone who could do that and merge there and start splitting the Tory vote on that flank, then I think um, the Johnson could get into trouble really quickly. Great. Right. Could you put your hands up? Um, very quickly on momentum. I draw momentum. It's the best three quid I ever spent because it's so obviously going to just destroy the Labour Party. <laughs> <laughs> I actually speak as sixteen. Um, lots of reference to the Brexit Party. I was one of the Brexit Party MPs for Yorkshire and the Humber. Um, actually wrote the manifesto, which or contract with the people, which you just watch the Tory Party tittle tittle the policies off. Um, but I want to come back to Morris's fundamental point, the distinction between the working class and the poor. And the only way, and I'm not trying to say that, as you said, the poor don't vote, but that doesn't mean that everybody who doesn't vote is poor. But the turnout in the general election was 67%. That's a third of people are not voting. And just, just remember the reason why the referendum was won was because people who voted never voted before. And if you can get a message out that actually if people don't, who don't vote, you vote, that's how you get changed. And the Tories and the Labour Party would be terrified of that. Because if the third of people who don't vote voted, they have no idea how they came to vote. That's how you get changed. Um, I just wanted to look at this point of um, uh, which party would benefit the poor. And to me, that would be when you, you look to convert poor into aspirational working class uh, voters um, who can exercise their agency through jobs and uh, raising living standards. And the last time we saw that obviously was at the Brexit impulse. Um, however, what you don't see is that in uh, two of the biggest opposition parties, and that's well, not, Labour's not that big anymore, but the Labour Party and particularly the SNP, um, because it looks to me like they are trying to emasculate the poor even further mm. by uh, handout culture. Um, you can really see this in the way that uh, the Scottish National Party, and I, I live in Scotland, um, where um, they, they really try to push uh, Boris to extend the furlough indefinitely on moralistic grounds. Um, and they are also a big pusher of this universal basic income, which is basically incentivising idleness, in my opinion. Mm. And there's a huge movement for that, not just in Scotland, but in Wales. Not a huge movement in Wales, but they've got experiments being thought about in Wales, and also they've got an experiment going just now in, in Spain, around UBI and in Canada. So I just want to know uh, what the panel think of that, uh, which, you know, what I think is like handout culture and a way of keeping the working class, uh, sorry, the poor, quiet, sit in the sofa, shut up, and wait for the rules to change. So, um, my question to the panellists, the term woke has been used 13 times so far during this debate. What would you actually define woke as? How does it relate to the debate? And 
Do you, do you think it relates to the debate? I think in certain um, speeches that you've made so far, I think it's been used as a buzzword, personally, but I think the point that you made about ethnic minorities and sort of the woke and the voting, I think that was a really good point, but I would just like to know a bit more about what you actually think about that. Great. I am a very passive member of the Labour Party who voted for Keir Starmer. Um, and the Labour Party really seems to lack any policies at all. Um, and I, I really don't understand why the Labour Party doesn't have its own policies in, to help the poor, why it doesn't have its own levelling up agenda, including on adult learning, vocational learning, training for the young. Uh, yeah, I want to know who the panel thinks is the best party of the middle class because there seems to be at least three parties, by my reckoning, who are vying for, say, 7% or so of people who are hyper green, hyper woke, and just, you know, the nice people, as, as we kind of think of them as. And I think that's why the culture war and wokeness is so important, is because those people matter. They're nice, they're good, whereas working class people are, are horrible. And you get the sense, listening to some people in Labour, as they're trying to redefine who the working class are, that even just having their support taints their, you know, their brilliant image. We don't want those nasty Brexiteers. We want to have nice graduates for them. Great. Hi. Um, I have a very. I'm trying to formulate the simplest question that I can to sort of uh, articulate my point. Is wokeness a substitution for an industrial policy in the UK? And if that's the case, which party is offering uh, the best bet for uh, having an industrial policy at all? Because I don't hear it. I don't hear the word industrialization coming up. Uh, someone like Paul Embry is one of the only people who seems to have mentioned that in the last couple of months. So is that? Yeah. Uh, that's that's the only question really. Somebody behind me asked, um, what should the party of the poor do for the poor? Well, I think the party of the poor, whoever it is, should, to help the, work, to help the poor, um, should go for jobs and should go for growth, and they should go for the cheapest form of energy you could possibly find to put it into place as quickly as possible. And that means nuclear, and it means fossil fuels, and it means ditching environmental politics, and it means ditching windmills and solar panels. Um, <laughs> Energy, energy is the primary resource. In so much as you can cheapen energy, you can cheapen everything. Um, so for a bit of context, I'm from a working class family and now I suppose I'm what you'd call poor um, in the sense that I have a job but I'm also on benefits because of disability so I can't work um, full time. And my honest view is that there isn't a party for the poor. I think party politics is designed to prevent any kind of real change. I don't doubt that there are good MPs in all parties, but the issue is that they represent their party, they don't represent their constituents. Um, because, you know, the whole system of whips and stuff is designed to stop MPs from being able to vote the way they want as individuals. And I honestly think the only way we'd ever have any real change is to make all candidates run independently and just scrap the whole party system. Um, I voted for Monster Avian Looney Party <laughs> in the last election <laughs> because I just, uh, yeah, I, I don't feel like I can vote, certainly not for Labour, Tories or the Liberal Democrats, and there just, there just doesn't seem to be any real option. But also I'd like to say that on the issue of what the working class think or what the poor think, it's worth saying that everybody thinks very differently. My, uh, my family, sorry, not my party, <laughs> was uh, divided on Brexit, for example, and everyone in my family votes very differently. Um, so I think it's just worth remembering there isn't a working class, a poor that will vote, you know, in one way. Thank you very much. I'm going to come back to the panel now and I'm going to come out for one last round of questions. So get thinking. Um, Katie, anything you want to pick up on there? Yeah, I'll just briefly pick up on a few of those. I think on the question, you know, why doesn't Labour have its own levelling up policy? Well, that's a question the Shadow Cabinet are also asking. Um, I have one Shadow Cabinet member say to me that they, despite all the questions, says, oh, the Tories have achieved nothing on it, you know, it could be a vacuous slogan. They said, well, 
they really don't like it because they think it's a bit like take back control. It level up implies ultimately that the government is on your side. They think that you need resources and other people shouldn't have them or have had too many in the past. So why don't they have something to respond to? And I think the problem is Labour is so busy navel gazing and the leader's office will say, oh no, we have to do the infighting bit to get to the bit where we can talk to the country. Um, but I think anyone who attended that conference in Brighton, I mean, it was just infighting. And yes, maybe Keir Starmer got rid of a few heckles to show that he could handle the odd heckler. But if I was sitting at home, I'd just, what my takeaway is that it's a divided party and it's still the case that at least a third of the people in that hall don't like him or what he says. And there's a long way to getting to the point where they can even come up with their own message. I think just on the question of, you know, um, I'm going to leave the other panel members to define woke. Um, but <laughs> in the question of, yeah, is woke in absence of something else? I think it's really telling, going back to Tory conference, that the government was so keen to try and take on some issues they could at least put in that vague umbrella. So working from home as the fight, um, Nadine Doris talking about how the BBC not, might not be here in 10 years. I think it's quite easy to do this kind of... Um, gesturing and putting values out because it's something that always plays well to the base but it's much easier than actually coming up with oh this is how we're going to improve skills in this number of years and show we've done anything on leveling up so I think it's definitely something the Tories throw out when they're a bit worried that they haven't got much to show they're very Tory and then I think just finally on the question of you know who is the party of this nice seven percent as um, the um, very good question put forward well you always had the Lib Dems Labour and the Tories all vying for that I think that Labour often talk about the working class vote as though almost they are tolerating those voters rather than the ones they're actually aiming for but I also think there's a criticism for the Tories here which is that tax rise the national insurance tax rise that is ultimately about protecting inheritance and I think that is very much a bung to those middle class voters in places like Chesham and Amersham which they lost to the Liberal Democrats to try and say you know well we still believe in this one Tory value of your inheritance travelling through and I do question given that is worse for you know areas in the red wall you saw some MPs such as Deanna Davison actively vote against it how long it is before that starts to bite um, because it does feel quite like quite an unjust policy. Thanks. Tom? Very yeah, quick. So quickly on woke, um, I can understand the irritation with the phrase being thrown around a bit too liberally. In some quarters, it has just become a byword for anything that might irritate Mark Francois of a morning or something like this, like any, <laughs> just any of those kinds of views. And that's not useful. I mean, it's, but I think fundamentally it comes down to um, an adherence to identity politics. And the question if we're talking about um, labour and class is a belief that your identity is fundamentally more significant to your place and struggles in society than your class, really. I mean, they don't often explicitly say this, but to the extent that woke people, if we are going to call them that, are interested in class, they see it as one identity amongst many, which intersect and all the rest of it. And I think the fundamental problem that the left and the Labour Party have, it, and that they share more broadly, is the fact that they have fundamentally um, undermined class politics via their embrace of identity politics. And then just very quickly on this point about UBI, I think it's really important, and it comes back to this point we keep returning to, which is the fundamental difference between the poor and the working class, is the fact that welfareism, which in many respects is the ideology of the Labour Party and which is something which is shared from the left to the kind of centre of it, uh, is, first of all, it's rejected by working class people. It's a fundamentally unradical proposition. It's about basic subsistence. It's about crumbs from the table and things like UBI, even though they're presented as incredibly radical and progressive, it's basically about putting working people out to pasture on some level. It's about making permanent wards of the state. It's about <laughs> suggesting that you should have no agency in your lives. Um, and the fact that this is even seen as a particularly radical proposition or even a kind of mainstream centre-left proposition, I think just speaks to how distant those parties and those thinkers are from working class people today. Thanks. Morris, do you want to pick up on just one point, please? OK, back out. Thanks. yeah, I was, I was kind of torn, but I'll choose one. Thank you. Um, that's, just, that's, that's trying to think about um, what you asked about woke and, and, and that. So what, to me, what it means is, is saying that the, that, that the degree of racism and sexism is so profound that it prohibits coalitions around class. This is, this is fundamentally what it is. It goes back to your point, you know, Remy, these issues have got to be discussed together, but if it means that there's no possibility of forming uh, um, class coalitions 
across race and across gender that make the position in the political economy the fundamental um, thing, um, then it will dissolve the possibility really of democracy because it will because there's a strange other side to woke, which is this radical choice. I can decide that I'm a woman. I can I can make and you have to honour that. So it combines a sort of in unbreakable, indubitable inheritance with a radical elevation of choice, and it makes politics, democratic politics, you know, being able to talk about stuff and come to provisional conclusions extremely difficult. I hope that helps in how I view that. Thanks, Morris. Seb, can you pick up on just one point as well, please? Um, oh, just one point there. Um, I was going to say, though, I would agree with Tom that the word woke has seemed to have lost all meaning now. And I think it was at Tory conference when one MP said the problem with Whitehall is they're woking from home. When I think he meant to say working from home, and that was the point which I thought is now completely meaningless. We well, spent weeks on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think the, the one point I think I might just want to pick up on out of all that, though, is, um, is the lady who talked about party politics and how you'd like everyone to sort of just stand on their own individual platform. I can see why that's appealing, um, but I think also it would make governing almost impossible, and that's ultimately why party politics kind of exists in a way. Um, and I think you do see some MPs getting better at standing on platforms that suit their individual constituencies, even within the boundaries of what the national manifesto is. So I think there is starting to get a bit more choice there. And as, as you know, there's many bad things about the professionalization of politics, but the fact people are devoting their careers to this now means they've become much closer and much more connected to the communities they, um, they represent. You know, when Churchill was the MP for Epping, he literally went once a year to his constituency and it was welcomed like, a, you know, well, obviously he was welcomed because he was Churchill, but I mean, it was the same for all MPs. At that um, at that particular point, um, I just wanted to mention the person as well. I mentioned industrial policy, so I am from the FT, and it would be I could not talk about industrial policy. Um, I think obviously that phrase again is slightly meaningless. Like we've tried, I, I don't know how many white papers I've read on industrial policy over and over again, and I know it might not be popular to some people in this room, but what the government is doing on pushing the green agenda is seen as very exciting by people in Teesside, for example, that the old steelworks are have gone, they're being totally demolished and being replaced by a wind turbine factory. We've got the biggest wind farm in Europe off the east coast um, of near Grimsby and also uh, Humberside as well. That is reindustrialization, and that is something that in those places, and I've been there and I can tell you, they're bloody excited about it because they haven't seen any new industries in about three or four decades. Thank you for your contributions today. It's been the, my favourite panel um, of the weekend. So, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so I've got one quick point and one question for you. Um, on the kind of why woke, if we're going to use that term, I'm not sure what other terms to use, so I'm going with that, um, why it matters this debate. Um, Harry Miller from Faircop was arguing about this um, in terms of crime and protection for women, that if you can't... Um, or are willing to publicly acknowledge women um, or the faith or ethnicity, whatever, whatever it might be, or the people you're trying to help level up, protect, what have you, how on earth are you going to shape policy for them? Um, so that was just a point on generally on why woke masses. Um, but my question that you kind of all touched on a little bit is with all of this talk of things not really working in any party at the moment, particularly for working people, for poor people. Um, do you see any time soon the kind of veil of, oh, we'll give them a chance, it's been difficult, COVID, Brexit, whatever, that voters will start to actually say, no, enough is enough, we're going to vote with our feet or we're going to start protesting or we're going to bombard our MPs or whatever? Or do you think it would just going to carry on and carry on and carry on? The next election comes and it's the same old again, what, do you see there being any kind of people's movement in response? Do you kind of think that the depoliticisation of certain areas and the economic issues has been a great problem? One of this example is the uh, independence of the Bank of England that was made when New Labour gave got in, and no one said a thing since. Very good question as well. So um, my, my grandfather stood for Labour when Clement Attlee was Prime Minister and he didn't win. But uh, on his election address, he had this line where he said, I have undying faith in the basic sanity of the ordinary people of this country. Yeah. And I think that that has completely gone from the political culture of the Labour Party. And the European Union was symptomatic of that because the European Union 
took certain issues out of politics, made them matters of treaty obligations and so on. I wondered if the panel could reflect on Labour's turn to the judiciary as an institution that actually takes entire issues out of party politics. It doesn't really matter what the party stands are and leaves it to matters of judicial interpretation and judicial rulings. No matter who, which party is the party of the, part, uh, of the poor and is the party of the working class, I think the reason why we're gathered here and concerned about this issue is because it's very clear that Labour ought to overwhelmingly be the party of both the poor and the working class. And it's deeply, deeply disturbing to many of us, uh, certainly I've been following politics for decades, decades that its position of superiority amongst those two classes of the electorate is so compromised at the moment. Why is it that this cutting that I have here, which says business is drunk on cheap labour, which is talking about the HGV crisis, is accompanied by a photograph of the Chancellor Rishi Sunak and not a prominent Labour politician. And the reason is because Labour whether or not it's ahead in the polls or behind in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the electoral terms, it's not making the arguments of the poor. It's not making the arguments of the working class. This is not that difficult, though, for Labour to put right. If only it had accepted the challenge placed by Leave up in front of people as prominent as Tony Blair to simply accept the result, then the dialogue would have been resumed. And there are plenty of big electoral targets to go for. The one that I'm particularly interested in at the moment of the working class is the white working class, it's the self-employed, the tradesmen, the HGV drivers, the carpenters, the electricians, the small builders. These people are being hammered by this government and have no one to speak up for them. Thank you. Um, right, we're going to come back to the panel for final thoughts. Um, we've only got about five minutes, so I'm going to get in trouble if you speak for longer than a minute, Morris. <laughs> but, <laughs> can you please try? So, First, apologies for people whose, response, whose questions I haven't responded to. Um, just fundamentally, what, what you're saying is, is that the response of the left ever since um, George Brown, let's, so let's actually date it, that there, in 64, uh, Labour was elected to have a super ministry that would replace the Treasury, that would have industrial strategy, that would... By 1966, that was gone, and ever since then, the progressive left has found anything to avoid politics. So let's just get to that. That what you're saying is politics is about the ability, to, Machiavelli said, the ability to act in time. But what Labour like to do is say, you're not going to be able, we're not going to act rightfully. We're going to hive off interest rates to the Bank of England, so we can't act on that. And then we've got fantastic. We've got the judiciary. Let's create a, what's whatever it's called, a high a supreme court. So I'm very much in favour of bringing the law you know, the Supreme Court back into the Lords, subordinate to the sovereignty of Parliament. You know, that the law is subordinate, the common law works within the framework of Parliament. So any time there's a commission, any time there's a quango or an NGO, it's got to be political action. And until the left can front up and say, yeah, industrial strategy, yeah, we're going to invest loads of money um, in the North. I don't think, by the way, Sebastian, it's a, it's a, it's a meaningless it's a meaningless phrase because the treasury is so hostile to production mm. that there needs to be an opening up of national self-sufficiency national renewal we saw it all in covid I'm not going to rehearse but just to say that the answer to the two questions is the same it's the desire of the progressive left to subordinate politics to procedure always and that's what needs to be broken thank you morris katie final thoughts yeah, just very briefly, I suppose, going on, you know, is this give them a chance, uh, you know, sense in politics starting to wear off? You've seen in the pandemic, I think, that the government, if you look at some of the things that have happened, they haven't been punished in the way people thought they would. Um, I think, actually, even if you look at the Hartlepool by-election, which is seen as, you know, a big sign that the Tories are solidifying that realignment, it was also at the same time as the peak of the vaccine bounce. So I do think we have to take in some of those factors into consideration. Um, but... 
it was interesting reading a poll recently uh, in the Telegraph just saying the Tories have lost their reputation as the parties of low tax when it comes to the question of which party do you think is on your side for people like you on tax labour ahead? But amongst the working class, the Tories were still ahead. So I think it's still go it's going to come down to a question of who is more on your side. Um, at the moment, I think that uh, the Tories still look as though they are trying. The question is, after you know what's going to be a pretty horrible at least three months, maybe six months, maybe this short-term disruption is going to go much longer. And some of that being down to government policy itself, like universal credit. Does Keir Starmer have an opportunity to get ahead? I think the issue, it goes to the points about what does Labour stand for, is right now I think even Keir Starmer's own MPs are not sure he can take that chance. Thanks, Katie. Tom, final thoughts? Very yeah, good. so uh, this point about um, politicising the economy, I think it's fascinating that we've started to see that, and it's as a direct result of the Brexit vote and of the 2019 vote um, to a large extent. And I should just say, in closing, I'm not a supporter of Boris Johnson, I'm not a Conservative, I didn't vote for this government. I mean, I've called him a phony populist in the past, and I remain very sceptical of him and his programme. But that election result, paired with the referendum, was still incredibly positive. First of all, because I think Labour completely deserved it. The Labour Party has always really historically existed to rein in the aspirations of the working class, but that became brutally clear with the Brexit vote. Um, but more fundamentally, I think it demonstrated what can happen when... Again, a proper democratic question is put to people because through the combination of 2016 and 2019, working class people made themselves matter in a way that we haven't seen for many, many decades. And long may that continue. Thanks, Tom. Seb, final thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Um, the point about economic depolitisation is really, really interesting. And I think when Rishi Sunak is looking at the size of the UK's debt pile, he's wishing he had direct control over interest rates at the moment instead of the governor. Um, I think the point about Labour ought to be the party that the gentleman made there. I think the fundamental reason that Labour has not got an answer to this and Labour is taking its clothes is because of where the Tories have moved to. You know, and Labour keeps getting itself in this mess saying, oh, but the Tories have been in power for 10, 11 years. Why are people buying into this? The fact is 2019 was a break moment that, you know, David Cameron gone off um, you know, making lots of money in the private sector. George Osborne left Parliament. So when people look at this government, it sounds and feels and is acting like a whole new administration there with totally different economic policies, different migration policies. And this is the thing Labour's got to work out. Where do they go when you've got a, a party that's straddling the left and the right there? So I think that's, you know, Kate and I, I think, were both in Brighton, and they're very good at infighting and having rows about that. They still don't really have a big idea to match what levelling up is. And until it gets that, then I think it's just going to be, you know, it can't represent the working class or anyone else, really. Can we please thank our panel? <laughs>